I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. <laughs> What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fourth That's Not Our Podcast once again. I'm Josh Shevinoff, well, uh, joined by the amazing, as always, Angel Ortega. Uh, lots of to talk about this week. Um, UFC Vegas 44, Jose Aldo, Rob Font, obviously going down at the apex. Bells for 272, a massive fight, arguably the best fight of the weekend, in Sergio Pettis and Koji Horiguchi. A little, little bit of boxing stuff, as always. This episode is brought to you by Rogue Energy. If you get 10% off your order, you go to sound off at checkout. Let's go sound off a checkup for 10% off of all your energy needs. Uh, as mentioned, this weekend, UC Vegas 44 going down at UC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada, a bantamweight showcase between contenders Rob Font and Jose Aldo. Obviously, a huge fight here. Uh, both guys ranked inside of the top five, Font being number four, Aldo being number five. Uh, both guys here, real, honestly, bantamweight is a bit of a log jam, obviously, with uh, Algermain Sterling being out due to injury. Piotr Jan's the interim champion, and they obviously have TJ winning in the wings as well. Winner here may not be in line for a title shot, but they will put themselves in the conversation uh, for somewhere down the line. So, Angel, my guy. Huge fight going on this weekend. Very, very close according to the betting odds. I've seen a lot of people going both ways. Uh, so what do you think about this one going down this weekend? And obviously, very excited. You know, you, you, you said it wasn't the biggest fight this weekend. I, I don't know. I think, I think, I, I felt like, you know, the other one has title connotations. We won't get into it now, but I thought this is still a pretty big fight, right? I mean, it has Jose Aldo, you know, like, I feel like that, that name carries a lot of weight, don't you think? I mean, I, I just kind of want to put it out there because I heard someone else say the same. Actually, I heard pretty much everybody else who does what we do in some capacity or follows it in May in some form of media kind of say the same thing to an extent. Mm hmm. I did bring up Jose Aldo in the mix, but you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not necessarily that I'm trying to dog on this fight. It's it's because, uh, honestly, I think part of the reason why it's being – I said it's arguably. Uh, the other fight is referring to Sergio Pettis, Hojo, Koji Horiguchi is arguably the best fight of the weekend. I think that's probably being put forth because I think a lot of people just kind of disrespect Rob Font because of his weird rise that's kind of gone to the radar. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that it is the best fight of the weekend, but I understand the argument both ways. It's funny because, you know, someone on this card beat Sergio Pettis. Well, I think... Actually, his last fight in the UFC. Well, actually, second. Yeah. Well, yeah, second to last fight, which... I remember that fight. I remember him being super hyped up going to that one, Sergio, because obviously he beat Joby around that same time. So, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that Sergio fight soon, but just as far as the matchup going this weekend, um, it feels like... Which I feel like is perfect, honestly, that it's Rob Font in the situation. Because Jose Aldo, at this point in time... He's a living legend. He's finally, he's, I feel like for a long time, he never really got his flowers. He never really got a whole lot of the respect that he obviously deserved, um, especially because of the way that he lost his belt and the way a lot of stuff went down with Connor and his, him leaving 145. I think like he's starting to get a lot of that respect back. He's starting to get his flowers while he's still here, which is honestly really awesome. But I feel like Rob Font is being completely overlooked. Uh, are you kind of getting that same vibe going into this fight? I mean, to an extent, I feel like he's getting his respect, too, because, uh, you know, he's finding himself in this position, and obviously his last time out, dude, what a fucking performance, right? Like, you gotta give the guy credit. I'm, I think I picked against him. Without a doubt, I think I picked against him in this last fight against Cody. And, uh, you know something? I was so dumbfounded, I didn't realize what was going on. Like, I didn't realize Cody was losing. You know what I mean? Like, that was a legitimate thought in my mind. And it's not because I thought Cody was winning the fight. I was just confused at everything that was going on in that moment. Like I'm like, oh shit, Cody's actually losing this fight to Rob Font. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously I think a lot of people kind of I know that Rob Font was a pretty good, pretty decently sized underdog going into that one too, probably because of just the fact that I want to say he's been an underdog in like the vast majority of his recent fights. Um, I know for a fact he was to Cody. I know for a fact he was to Marlon. And, dude, just if that four-fight streak is on, Sergio, Ricky Simone, Marlon Marais, Cody Garbrandt, it's such a nice streak of names. But also, you know, those little things you could poke at with each name, at least as far as, like, Cody obviously had COVID, Marlon's on a terrible streak, Sergio hadn't hit his stride, and Ricky Simone, I mean, that was a good win. There's no really excuse he's going to make for that one. But, yeah, it's kind of just a weird winning streak in general, which definitely kind of led to him to being in the position where he is now. Um Kind of on the same page with you, at least in regard to that Cody one. It was, it was kind of a weird fight, and it felt like Cody never really got out of first gear. 
um, which I think is kind of what led way to it. But yeah, as far as the fight this weekend, dude, um, Jose is obviously coming off of two wins in a row. And I think his bantamweight move has gotten a lot better than what a lot of people really thought it would. I remember whenever he first announced he was going down to 135, I thought he was going to be, honestly, just completely, I thought he was going to pre- do pretty terrible. I'm going to be completely honest. I thought, um, he was getting older. And as you get older, you really don't tend to go down in weight. You tend to go up in weight. And he was already a really, really big featherweight as it is. But, you know, dude, he's managed to turn around. He lost his first two fights there, technically. I think most people have had him beating Marlon, but he did lose that one via split. Um, and then, obviously, the Peter, Peter Jan loss is just horrific, terrible stoppage. But then, dude, rebounded against Marlon Vera and Pedro Munoz. The Pedro Munoz win just completely dominating back in 265 in August. So going into this weekend, dude, if you have to go ahead and make a pick, who do you got in the bantamweight contender fight at UFC Vegas 44? You know, man, I've never lost out on this man, and I still won't. You know, and I picked against this guy. You know, I picked against Raw Font last time, so I'm going to pick against Raw Font again. I'm picking Jose Aldo, Josh. <laughs> I think he gets it done. I know. I, I, ha- I was going back and forth there, wasn't I? Yeah, you. I honestly, you were, really were, dude. You had to go for a minute there. Um, Got you I'm really excited. Go yeah, I'm going to go do the different thing. I picked against Rob Fawn. I want to say almost every single fight that, like, on the podcast that we've talked about, I'm pretty sure I picked against Rob Fawn every single time. Um, and even outside of the podcast, I thought Sergio Pest was going to put an ass up on him. I was wrong about that. And, dude, this is a guy that's just, he has evolved as his time has gone on, and I feel like he's super, super overlooked. His boxing is crisp. And I really think he's uh, being slept on going into this weekend. I'm going to go and take with V. Jose Aldo, get another upset win, and just continue this, this honestly, evolution of his game, which has been so impressive and so insane to watch. Just And moving on from that, like, I'm going to go and pick him, but, I mean, moving forward, either guy, Aldo or Fon, getting the win this weekend, it, it's kind of in a weird place, the bantamweight division, because neither guy is really going to get a whole lot from this win. Like, bare minimum, they're going to have to sit on the shelf. If they think they are they deserve a title shot, they're going to sit on the shelf for a long time. Like, who do you think the winner of this gets next? That's a tough one. Do you think, do you think well, that's weird. I was going to say, could you see a Corey Sanhagen being thrown out there? I feel like that's a weird uh, thought, especially since Corey's coming off a few losses. But it's like you, you read into those losses and it's a different story. Hmm. Yeah, I really think that um, it kind of makes sense, but it kind of doesn't. I think Corey's probably going to need – he's had two back-to-back wars. I think you should give him a lower-ranked guy for his next fight. That's just my opinion, though. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, as far as – but even then, dude, Bantamweight is, Bantamweight is probably the greatest division in the UFC right now. If you look at pure talent-wise, there are guys that are unranked that are absolutely fucking monsters. Um, but at the same time, like, I really don't know what they're going to go ahead and do with the winner of this moving forward. But, um, regardless, dude, I, we're, we're, we're splitting on this. And I think it's important that we're splitting on this fight because I'm just going to go ahead and give you guys a quick update. As far as the sound off picks goes this year, obviously I track them all year long. I'm currently up by three. It's, I have a record 90 correct, 45 incorrect, and two draws. Angel, you're sitting at 87 correct, 48 incorrect, and two draws. So, Time for the greatest comeback in history. It's time for the greatest comeback. Going to have to go ahead and pull out all the stops. Obviously, the pay-per-view is going to play dividends, which is I, I, cho- I think I choked some, too. I think I choked some early on on a, in the year. I had some fuck it picks. And honestly, the fact that we're only three apart is kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah. So, it's important that we split there for you if you're trying to go ahead and move up. But moving on to the co-main event, which I'm a little bit sad that this is a co-main event. I truly think this is a fight that deserves five rounds. Um, two of the greatest prospects at lightweight, Brad Riddell, currently 10-1 and one on a nice four-fight winning streak in the UFC and beating a couple of monsters in that stretch as well, taking on Rafael Fazeev, 10-1 and one as well, also on a four-fight winning streak in the UFC and has also beat a couple of monsters during that stretch as well, man. It, very rarely do we have a co-main event of this caliber. So what are you looking for going into this one? Looking for fucking action, dude. I expect a fucking stand-up for Muay Thai versus kickbox. I mean, what what else would you love to see, right? Mm-hmm. One's an orthodox. One can switch stances. I mean, they both have a fair bit of finishes on their record. One guy even has a submission win. I, I doubt. 
Does it, do you think this fight would really hit the ground though? Like, could mm. it? It's not like I would it's be not, shocked. I feel like it's it's not like they're not capable of taking it down there because they have. But mm. it's not it's it's not necessarily what I think will happen. I think this could be a fucking on the feet distance management back to back war. I mean, I mean I don't know if it'll be end up being a war, but I think it'll be you know a nice little dance between two guys. Hmm. Yeah, entirely. I, I'd be shocked if this one hit the mat. Um, neither one of the and now granted this does happen occasionally, um, where you have two really really good strikers and it turns into you know guys shooting for takedowns and sometimes you have guys that are really good takedown guys and it turns into a striking match. Sometimes the inverse happens, but I really don't think that's going to be the case this time. Like I, I this has fight of the night written all over it. Um, as far as the actual pick though. What do you got coming out in this? Obviously, both these guys, lightweight is a division that is simultaneously top heavy, but also pretty damn open. Obviously, you have a title fight going down next week. You got Gaethje waiting in the wings, Makachev and Dariush. They're going to be fighting next year. But outside of like those top couple of guys, it's a very open division. Winner here can put them, put that name, put their name into the mix. Rather, who do you got coming out of this one? You know, I'm torn on this man. I, I think these are two very talented guys who have a uh... Very good skill sets. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go Raphael Fiziv, man. I feel like this is a pick and fight, though. I feel like you could either pick Brad Durdell and it'd be a good pick, and I feel like you could pick Raphael and it'd also be a great pick. Mm. Yeah, entirely. It's about as close to a pick as you get, which I feel like it's perfectly in line with the main event. Um, these are both very much pick and fights, at least in my opinion. Uh, since they're a pick em, though, I'm actually also going to go the other guy. Uh, I'm going to go and take Brad Riddell to get the nice decision win here, dude. He really turned me. He really did turn me during that Drew, Do- that Drew Dober fight. The first couple of minutes, Dober was putting it on him, dude. He was having to take a lot of right hands. And he was having to really going to have to rally, and he really did. And it was a phenomenal fight, fight of the night at UC 263. And he showed a lot. And uh, I truly think he's just continued to evolve his game. Obviously, he was a phenomenal kickboxer back in the day. Um, which, by the way, Angel, have you seen? I'm sure you've seen the clip. Um, of him, you know, like the, the Shaolin monk guy, Yi Long, <laughs> who has like his chin down. He's just taking a shitload of punches, like in a kickboxing match. Have you seen this clip? I don't think I have. Oh man. Well, let me actually find it real quickly on, on air because for the longest time, I guarantee that you've, um, seen this clip before, but you've probably not known that it's Brad Riddell in the clip. Um, cause Wait, it like, was. Yeah, I found it. unintentionally, I found it. Yeah, but he's that, the one getting he's the one getting hit, or he's the one giving the hits. He's the one giving the hits. Isn't that fucking crazy? If you guys are not, if you, they actually fought three times, uh, Yi Long is actually is this guy just a beast? Like the guy who's hitting? Uh, kind of. Uh, it, it's a, it's a weird thing. Yi Long is actually he has the Shaolin monk character. He's more WWE than anything else. Oh, uh, as I was say, but he, is he actually a monk though? No, or not? No. That's no, no, no. But he he put all he puts on that persona. He's a he's pretty damn good. I believe his record is like sixty two and twelve. Uh, he's old now. You're older now. Um, and yeah, I know he actually fought last month. and got like a knockout win, but that fight looked pretty damn fixed. Yeah, dude, they fought three times back in the day, and Yi Long took two of them. But yeah, that that clip of him not getting knocked out's gone super viral over the years. I think it happened like maybe even like eight or nine years ago. Yeah, that's Brad Riddell punching that motherfucker, and he did not go down. Um, so yeah, Brad Riddell, tough dude. I'm going to go and take him to the co-made event. I truly think he's a, he's younger. Uh, I think he's got a lot of potential, dude. I really think he does. Half fight Fazeev, it could be just his last fight is sticking in my head. Um, he's obviously his fight against Bobby Green. That was fight of the night, but I thought that was a fight where Bobby Green's a tough guy, but if you want to go and show yourself as being a potential lightweight champion, a potential contender, you needed to give me a better performance than what Rafael Fazeev did on that night. Um, yeah, that was a very close fight. That could be sticking in my mind as to why I'm not picking it, but yeah, I'm going to go and take Brad Riddell in the co-main to go and get the win, move up the rankings, and put himself in that title conversation. As far as the rest of the card goes, dude, this is a, this is a pretty damn deep one. Um, you know, a lot of the time, these, these fight night cards are kind of just one fight, two fight card, especially, especially now, obviously, with the Apex being the place where they hold these fight nights and they have pay-per-views with fans involved. But I think this is a pretty damn deep card. Uh, what are some of the fights that you're particularly looking forward to watching on this one? I mean, Josh, we could just go down when uh, Jimmy Crute, Jamal Hall. I mean, a good matchup for Jimmy Crute to come back to. Also, I mean, a fun matchup for Jamal Hall. Mm. Or Hale, my bad. I said Hall. I kept it, I, my bad. Chill. <laughs> and Nunk. 
Keep saying, oh, you didn't stop me, Josh. The I, I wasn't going to correct you. I was going to let you go off on your tangent until you were done. And I was going to be like, uh, Angel, it's, it's Jamal Hill, actually. Jamal Hill. I don't know why I said Hall. Oh, my bad. Yeah, my, our, our bad, Jamal. Um, but yeah, dude, I actually hate this matchup. <laughs> really? I think it's a fun matchup. I know it's because they're, it they're young. It's because it's they're young entirely. I hate these fights where they're young, dude. Now, granted, Jamal Hill's not young. He's 30, but he's young in the MMA sense. He's only been fighting since 2017. And um, it'd be one thing if they were also, like, they were colliding when they were on winning streaks. Both these guys lost bad last time out. So, yeah, that's that's part of my issue. But it was injury-based for both of them, though. For both actually, of them, yeah. It was funny. Did you know, actually, I looked it up. Did you know Jamal Hill has six fucking kids? <laughs> Not as much as uh, uh, Cowboy Oliveira. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, th- I think we talked about it on the podcast. Cowboy has like eleven kids. Jesus, what a, what a stud! Um, what a, what a fucking stud! Yeah, d- uh, yeah. But I I hate this fight. I I like it and I dislike it. Um, because it on paper absolute banger. I mean, I have zero complaints. At least for like the fighting style, these dudes are gonna fucking bring it one hundred and ten percent. Um, and I still I still think Jamal Hill has a lot of potential in the division. I really think he just got caught against Paul Craig, and that happens. Um, in this in this game that we play, and same thing for Jimmy Crude. I thought he was winning that fight until obviously the nerve thing happened against Anthony Smith. So it's gonna be a fun fight. I just just like the fighting this soon. Um, but dude, you know what fight I'm excited for? I'm excited for the old guy fight of the century. Dude, it's actually Clay, fun as shit. Yeah, Clay Guida taking on Leonardo Santos, 41 year old Santos taking on 39 year old Hall of Famer Guida. Um. Dude, you know, Clay Guida has such an interesting career trajectory, and I don't think it really gets talked about. At one point, he was he was a strike force champion. He was a guy that was in title eliminators. Um, you know, he beat Prime Pettis back in the day. He beat Josh Thompson, Diaz, Dos Anjos, Gomi. Like he he just beat all these dudes. Over the last few years, he's kind of evolved his game from being a you know a contender to being kind of the I don't want to say cowboy esque. But kind of cowboy esque in the fact that not that he's fighting all the time, that he'll fight fucking anyone. Um, he he now holds a record thirty six and twenty one. He fought Mark Madsen last time out, and Mark oh, Madsen going into that fight, it, that turned to be a pretty big, pretty close fight. But he was expected to get run over beforehand. And Mark Madsen super hyped up. Um, he had a close fight with Bobby Green, and Bobby Green's been on a good run. He just he's turned into like a game as fuck dude, and he, the guy who's also game as fucking old, Leonardo Santos. And had he not lost to Green Dawson, we'd be talking about him as potentially in the rankings and so on and so forth. Isn't that wild? Um, 41 year old guy at lightweight in the rankings. Yeah, and both these guys aren't that far off, in my opinion. I think had had Clay beat uh, Mark Madsen, which arguably he did, you know, it was a split decision, uh, he'd be close to the rankings as well. Same thing for Leonardo Santos. I think the only thing that's holding him back is an activity. That's always been the case with him. Um, you know, he beat Kevin Lee, RIP Kevin Lee, by the way, getting cut this past week. Um, Crazy. He, he beat Can't Anthony Rocco. PFO? Yeah, I think, I think that's where he's probably going to go, actually. Really? Um, Not Bellator? No, I don't think so. I think most of these guys are seeing the PFL, like, they all go there thinking it's going to be, like, an easy thing. And none of them, none of them have actually had it easy. Which is funny. Um, for Verdum and Pettis both went over thinking it's going to be an easy ride. They both got. Hey, my boy Verdum got cut, though. He did, but that was actually reversed. That's not even why he didn't make it in, though. I know, but now, he, still, he still got cut. But anyways, uh, yeah, dude. A lot of those guys are kind of going over there. I think it's going to be, like, an easy path, and I think they're going to get – I think they're learning, dude. PFL is better than what people kind of think. Um, but, yeah, dude. Leonardo Santos also beat Anthony Rocco Martin. Uh, also rip Anthony Rocco Martin, who got arrested this past week. Uh, God damn, everybody. Yeah, apparently if you fight Leonardo, rip uh, Stevie Ray, who Leonardo Santos beat, and he got cut from the UFC. Uh, <laughs> apparently you should not lose the Leonardo Santos if you want to have like a good life, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, that's going to be a fun old guy fight. Let's go ahead and hope for Clay Guida's sake that he wins that one. Hey, um, Clay Guida doesn't get knocked out, though. Like, you got to give credit to Clay Guida. Like, Clay Guida doesn't get like finished. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's a, he's a chin of iron. He's a guy that I'm happy made it into the Hall of Fame. You know what I mean? Now, granted, you made it in for, you know, the fight. He made it into the fight wing, which I think... Hey, but he'll uh, forever be, at least in some way or some shape or form, in the Hall of Fame. Like regardless. Correct. Him him and Diego Sanchez, which, you know, send in thoughts and prayers out to our uh, friend Diego Sanchez, currently in the hospital right now due to COVID. Isn't that crazy? Sure. I hope, he, I hope yeah. he gets better soon. Yeah, I went ahead and... 
you know, let's, let's just go ahead and hope, hope for the best there. From what I've heard, it's, it's not, he's in a terrible situation, but let's just go ahead and hope for the best there. Um, but yeah, both those guys made into the Hall of Fame for that fight back in 2009, I think. Just absolute legendary fight. I'm glad the fight wing exists to kind of enshrine those guys. Like, I've heard some people complain about the UFC Hall of Fame, about how, like, it's arbitrary, and it is. What are the awards that, in the Hall of Fame for, or what, what stuff gets put into the Hall of Fame for the UFC? I've actually never looked into it. Yeah, so there, I believe there's four different wings. There's the modern era. There is the um, I don't know what, what what they would call it. It's like the, the the pioneer era. I don't I know that's not what they dubbed it, but it's like for those older generation. Fighters. For some reason, I feel like you're actually right though. Yeah, it might be. And then there's the kind of contributors, which is like I know they put in Joe Silva for that. I know they put in um, other athletic commission members that are like influential. In that's a weird one. Bro. That's a weird that, one to me. I, it I is a weird one. It's not They're bad. I I, res- I respect it though, but it, I think it's an odd one. Yeah, they're going to rat out of people soon. And they also have the fight wing, which is how you guys have guys like Diego Sanchez and Clay Guida get in there, which I'm glad that one exists because fight should be enshrined into the Hall of Fame. It also gives way for like a lot of guys like, for example, um, Jim Miller wouldn't make the Hall of Fame normally. But I guarantee you, one of these days, Jim Miller, Joe Lowe's on one is going to be enshrined into the Hall oh, of Fame. Banger. <laughs> yeah, and both those guys are going to make the Hall of Fame because of shit like that. And that's stuff that I like because I've always thought like the Hall of Fame for, for MMA – it doesn't need to be like baseball. Baseball, it, it's the most strict one I can think of, you know. Uh, football is kind of iffy. I'm not sure how basketball is. It's all players, I'm pretty sure. And then, like, they'll yeah. add – I think it's, like uh, – what's the word for it? I can't think but of just, it. Well, they have, they'll have, like, their coaches and shit like that. Yeah, yeah. But, just, but just, like, I'm talking, like, voting-wise, baseball's a bitch getting in. Why? Uh, Why is that? Well, just generally speaking, there's a lot of different um, – there's a whole bunch of voters, and they're super fucking arbitrary. Uh, especially the media, they'll hold grudges. Like, Barry Bonds isn't in. Pete Rose is not in. And I understand why, because Barry Bonds got caught for steroids, but quite literally everybody in that era, they were all juiced. Like, Same. everybody. <laughs> that, that's not even a joke. Like, Mark McGuire, um, Jose Gansenko, they were all juiced in that era. And Barry Bonds was still – he was a Hall of Fame player before he got juiced and added 50 pounds of muscle. So – um, and Pete Rose bet on him. He bet on other games, I believe, is the story. Um, the games that he was not a part of, and I know that he also bet on himself to win. And they have a super anti-strict betting clause. And also, if you were a dick to the media, they won't let you in. UFC does not need to be like that. Now, there are guys that are never going to make it in because they got beef, like Frank Shamrock, are never going to make it in the Hall of Fame, um, which is terrible. But I've always thought, like, the Hall of Fame should be more like what the UFC is doing. Like, and allowing guys who had a phenomenal career... Maybe they didn't win a championship, but having them enshrined is honestly awesome. So that's just one example. Um, I understand we went a bit off topic there. Talk about Clay Guida in the Hall of Fame, but yeah. Um, Dope, though. Yeah, I thought it was a good conversation. But moving on, dude. Uh, slept on fight of the card. Brendan Allen, Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis, dude, literally a month ago got a huge knock at winner of Phil Hawes. He's already back. He's taking on Brendan Allen, who's one of the greatest prospects in the UFC, 25 years young, 17-4, and four, only loss in the UFC is to Sean Strickland, and his only losses throughout his career are all to UFC guys, um, quite literally every single one. Trevin Giles in his third fight, Eric Anders in his ninth fight, Anthony Hernandez in LFA, and now Sean Strickland in the UFC. Outside of that, Kevin Holland, Tom Breed, Kyle Baucus, Carl Robertson, he's beaten some fucking, like, some bad dudes out there. And Curtis Curtis turning around immediately. And I didn't even know this until this past week that he took this fight. Like, he stepped in on super short notice. So, shout yeah. out him getting another paycheck. There's been and two all- opponent changes for Brendan Allen. It was Brad Tavares. Yeah. And I don't know if it was – I think it was Brad Tavares originally. And uh, Roman Delete say at one point. Yeah. So, it's been it's been a rough one for him. And he's taking on a guy that is coming off a huge win. Tons of knockout power. So, yeah, that's a, that's a rough fight for have to, like, opponent change or short notice. But Hey, I was right, though, Josh. I was like, he has to make a decent turnaround, though, like, or he's going to have to fight soon. I didn't think it was going to be this soon, but it was soon. Oh, yeah, dude, it's it's soon. And then I think the last fight I kind of want to highlight here, um, it's between our boy, Mickey Gall, and Alex Morono. This is kind of a fight that both these guys need badly, not in terms of being cut, right? Because neither one of these guys are at risk of being cut. I I, I don't think so. But they're also right on the verge um, of breaking into not really contendership, but that top 15 ranking that both those guys really desperately want. Uh, Mickey Gall beat the shit out of Jordan Williams last time out. And he's been such an inconsistent guy in the UFC because he came in so young, he had so little inexperience. 
Um, and I feel like that Jordan Williams fight, he really put it all together. I mean, everybody talked about Ian Gary beating Jordan Williams. Dude, Mickey Gall beat the shit out of Jordan Williams. Like, like that, that fight was not even close. Um, and obviously Alex Morono, a guy that, uh, former, I want to say LFA champion or LFC champion, something along those lines. He's always been an inconsistent guy, but he's turned it around. He's won three of four and he knocked out Cowboy Cerrone in that stretch. So yeah, dude, he, he, both these guys need this one if they kind of want to break into that, uh, that top 15 status. So I like that matchup a lot. But yeah, man, is there anything else you want to talk about on the CUC card before we move on? I mean, I mean, just to kind of touch up on that one, I feel it's, don't you think it's slightly weird matchmaking for Alex Morona and Mickey Gall? Like, I don't, I don't know. I didn't expect these guys to meet up at this point in time and. It kind of threw me off. I, I I just saw it and I was like, "That's interesting." I didn't think these guys would fight anytime soon. Mm-hmm. I actually had a hard yeah. time thinking of who Mickey was going to fight next. Actually, after that Jordan Williams win. Yeah. Um. Well, it it kind of it's it's weird matchmaking, but also kind of does make sense. Um. Because I think they're at a point with Mickey Gall where he's only he's 29 now, which makes me feel so old because I remember whenever he came in, he was like 24. And, like, he's literally been in the UFC for five fucking years. Almost six years now, which is insane. I remember thinking he was going to, like, I don't want to say he was, at one point I thought he was going to be a future champion, but I thought for sure, like, he was, like, so young, he had such good jiu-jitsu, and his striking was evolving. I'm like, dude, there's no way this kid's not going to be at least top 10, top 15. He's never done it. So I think the UFC's kind of at that point where they're like, all right, this kid, I'm sure he's on a decent contract because of, um, you know, in everything that he's done, like, all his high-profile fights. So I think I probably know that, and then kind of just thinking, like, all right, yeah, Alex Morono, he's on the outskirts of the top 15. He's close. Both these guys need a win if they want to break in, and I think that's kind of what their mindset is. I mean, they already tried to have him fight um, Alex Oliveira before. I believe oh, Mickey wow. had a f- fight with Oliveira set up for last year, and that fell through, and also was- Miguel Baeza. Wow. Those are all hard fights. Yeah, so I think they're kind of at that point now. Jordan Williams was supposed to be a tough fight. Um, I mean, he, he gave a close fight to Nasruddin, um, Nasruddin Imavov. That's where he gave his respect. That's where he gave yeah, and that fight was, that was, a, that was a close fight, dude. And uh, Nasruddin turned out to be like a fucking tough ass dude. So, yeah, I mean. Matt Brown's not going to be there though, Josh. Matt Brown has COVID though, so that kind of sucks for Mickey because that's who that, he brought in. That does that, uh, suck for Mickey, yeah. I'm assuming, I'm assuming he won't be there. Like, I don't know if they'll have him, like, on phone. You know, they'll have their head, you know, their main, they'll have the assistant coach, whoever their, or whoever the second coach would be, right? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm sure Matt, having Matt Brown there was kind of like a big thing. Cause I know in that Jerome Williams fight, that was a big thing. Like, he brought in Matt Brown. Matt Brown was in his corner. Now Matt Brown, actually, Matt Brown was going to fight on this card. And I'm assuming also Coach Mickey. Now that's mm. not going to happen. But he had, now he has COVID, so hopefully he gets better soon. Yeah, it's a shame. And hopefully he'll get better. But yeah, I think, it's very much a make or break fight for both these guys. Like I said, neither one's of the neither one's close to getting cut, but they're both getting older. This is kind of their last time to push to like kind of make their name and get into the ranking that way they're an established guy. Um at least that's kind of the feeling I'm getting for this one. Uh but yeah, I like the matchup a lot. It's weird matchmaking, like you said, I think, but also I think they're kind of realizing like and I think Mickey's probably realizing too, like his time is kinda it's kinda running out um as far as being coming a contender and all that stuff. Um, yeah, dude, honestly, really fun card. Um, I mean, there's, even then, there's like, there's other ones, like, down the line, like, uh, Chris Gritz, Mark Claudio, Pereles, which should be a lot of fun. Luis Smolka, Vince Morales, opening up the card, which should be a banger. Like, Luis Smolka always comes to bang. That should, that should be a very, very fun fight. Um, and then also, the last one I want to go and highlight, Alonzo Metafield, William Knight. Uh, Alonzo Metafield, um, the old, the youngest looking 34 year old man of all time. Like he, uh, if, if he would have told Damn. me he was 24, I would have believed you. And he's still, I think he's still got a lot of potential, got loads of knockout power. That Ed Herman fight was a banger. And, uh, you know, the William Knight, obviously coming off a nice knockout win in August over Fabio Charant. So yeah, it should be a very, very fun fight there, dude. Honestly, a great card, but you know, we talked about it at the start of the show, man. Um, Maybe not uh, top to bottom. Obviously, UFC cards better, but arguably the best fight of the weekend is Sergio Pettis taking on Koji Horiguchi, and the storyline heading into this one is phenomenal, dude. The Gooch, he's back in Bellator. <laughs> uh, yeah, he liked that one. Yeah, uh, that was that was out the, there, my guy. The, the Gooch is back in Bellator. 
Um, and he's back for the first time since 2019 to fight for the belt that he never lost. Um, obviously he had to vacate due to injury after his Kaya, uh, Kaya Soko. I'm not sure you pronounce that kid's name. Um, Kaya Soka, maybe? Ka- is it Kaya Sakara? Kaya Sok. Yeah, yeah. Um, he lost to him. Obviously he got knocked out. And then during that process, he also tore his ACL and I believe his MCL as well. Um, he had to spend a lot of time gone, he comes back, he knocked him out, and now he's going back to Bellator, and he actually signed, uh, obviously he left Risen, but he didn't really lift, he didn't really leave Risen, um, or excuse me, Ryzen, rather, um, he signed some weird deal where, like, he was gonna leave, but then he signed with Bellator, and I guess they have a working relationship, so he's still gonna fight in both of them, it was, it was bizarre, um, whenever that whole contract thing was unfolding, but regardless, he's back in Bellator now. He's fighting Sergio Pettis. Sergio obviously left to Bellator back in 2018, excuse me, 2019 after having like a really, really weird run with UC. He came in super young. He had his ups, he has his downs, but going into Bellator, dude, he's really turned it around. He, um, he's rattled off three straight wins and even the closest one during that stretch, during that stretch rather was the one on Chaletta fight that I thought he won pretty cleanly. He hasn't really been tested during his belt hole run, and now he's taking on arguably the greatest 135 pounder outside the UFC, and you can argue even on the planet. Um, so heading in this match with you, what are some of the things to watch, and what do you think about the fight in general? It's a fucking banger, and Josh, this will show why I picked fucking Hodaguchi last week, Josh. <laughs> this year, no, well, this played a factor into last week. It was all mental, Josh. You didn't, you didn't even know I was setting it up that, a week ago. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Well, by the way, you lost that vote as well. So also bullshit. Also bullshit. Whoever. Oh, was it? By the way, whoever didn't vote for me is a uh, you know fuck you guys. Feel free to unsub. Yeah, was it, was it rigged? Was it was it was a mail in voting angel? Was that the problem? The potential potential mail in voting. I mean, it was it, it's it's fucked, dude. Like it, it was such bullshit. You have no idea. If I could have a recount, I have a recount. It was close on Twitter. Fuck everybody on Instagram. They don't deserve my love. There's a reason I don't go on Instagram and I go on Twitter. So all the love. Well, they, well, they also lo- you also lost on Twitter as well. But that probably, one was closer. But that one was closer. I lost by like one vote. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, but that one that one was closer. But yeah, dude. So this fight is um, it's it's weird, right? Because Horiguchi never lost that belt. He beat Darion Caldwell, and I think the general consensus is is that we're still operating off of the idea that Horiguchi is as good as he was pre-ACL injury. Obviously, he knocked out Kai, and Kai's pretty fucking good as well. Um, nice. Absolute beast. But also, that, that fight was really early. He knocked out in two minutes. How will this fight go as it goes into the latter rounds? Because in the championship rounds, we're going to have to see the, his full ability now that coming back post-injury. And, I mean, obviously, the storyline a lot... I love it, like I mentioned earlier. Obviously, he's coming back to Bellator to, be, to fight for the title he never lost. Even Sergio Pettis is like, you know, I'm not really sure if I feel like I'm the right champion, if I am the champion, until I beat Horiguchi. So, do you think he gets it done on Friday night? Do you think he beats Koji Horiguchi? No, I don't think he does. I think Koji Horiguchi, and still, technically. Ooh. Dropping the and still, yeah, um... I respect that. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm the same page with you, dude. In fact, I think Horiguchi's gonna dominate. Um, I don't think this fight's gonna be very close. I've been a fan of Sergio Pettis for a long time, but I feel like the thing about Sergio Pettis is that we're still operating under the assumption that, you know, I feel like we've always talked about his potential rather than his actual output. I thought that Juan Angeletta fight was really, really good by him. I thought he showed, I mean, I think it was the best performance of his career, either that or the Joe B fight a couple years back. But even then, dude, it's just, I feel like we always talk about his potential rather than what he actually does. And Pettis has the talent. He has the potential that one day he can beat a guy like Horiguchi. But he needs to fully put it together. I don't think he's going to. I got the Gooch coming back. And still. Uh, never and he, forget. He, never forget. He reclaims the belt on Friday nights. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a fun fight, dude. I don't think he's going to go down lightly. I think the way that Horiguchi's fighting style, like the way he fights, is really going to play into a phenomenal fight here with Pettis, but I don't think he's going to be able to get it done. Um, regardless, though, going to be a fun fight. Co-main event, also an interesting fight. Emmanuel Sanchez, featherweight contender, always been, you know, one of the best at that weight class of Bellator for seemingly forever. Um, it feels he's been in the promotion since 2014. It's felt like he's been there since the beginning. He's taking on Jeremy Kennedy. 
Uh, Jeremy Kennedy, I've always said one of the weirdest UFC cuts of all time. Um, he was 3-1 and one in the UFC. He lost to Volkanovski, and then they cut him. The Volkanovski fight was his last, and they cut him, dude. Fucking weird. He beat Roni Jason and Kyle Boschniak during that stretch. Um, goes to PFL. Um, has a, a mixed run, obviously. He won a couple fights, did not end up winning the whole thing. He lost to Dana Panetta. That got overturned due to him testing positive for PEDs. Um, so, you know, he, he had a mixed run. Comes to Bellator 2020. He won one fight, but then he lost to Adam Boric. Looking to get back on the winning track. Both these guys have losses heading into this one. What do you think about this matchup? I'm a banger, too. Uh, I, you know, I got a feel for Emmanuel Sanchez, man. He he was really he really had a lot of faith in himself coming into that pit bull fight just because of you know how how it went and how he came to that last round and in his eyes and obviously he came back. Uh, I mean, this is his third fight this year, man. He really wants to get a win on the column, dude. I mean, I don't blame him. Right, he was he was on a good win streak and obviously got caught in that choke and uh, he had that Mads Burnell loss and he, he I think he's just beating himself over that. But I mean, you you can't you know I. I don't think he'd be that mad at himself about that one because obviously Matt Burnell is a guy who's also just fucking on a crazy run. Also a very interesting cut from the UFC, but that one that made, you know he 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 did have he was one and two, but it was only three fights. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, you know, just goes to show how life is. Sometimes you know you grow after you grow after your losses, man. And let me tell you this: uh, Matt Burnell has definitely grown after his losses, and. uh as far as Emmanuel Sanchez, I, I feel like he should have got it done this week, man. I mean, a lot of respect to Jeremy Kennedy, but is he really on the level of a guy like Emmanuel Sanchez? You know what I mean? Like, I, you got to give credit to Emmanuel Sanchez. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, kind of. I mean, I like Emmanuel Sanchez, but I, part of me wonders if he, – I mean, he's always been a guy that's had, like, a really good chin. Um, part of me wonders if that one day is going to fade. I actually think that uh, this is going to be it. I actually could take Jeremy Kennedy to be a big win here. I mean, I like Emmanuel Sanchez a lot. Um, but I thought that Madge Burnell fight was, I mean, I thought he looked slow in there, man. And that's the first time I thought that had been made about Emmanuel Sanchez. And he also got, you know, put to sleep by Patricio last time before he got completely dominated. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take Jeremy Kennedy. So I do think he's on that level. In fact, I think he's a level above him to go ahead and answer your question. <laughs> Just you fucking wait. Just you fucking wait, Josh. Is this the first time in Sound Off history that we've picked, like, the opposite guys, like, on almost every single, like, a fight available? I mean, we had Hodoguchi. Got you, both, you both picked Hodoguchi. Oh, that's right. My bad. My bad. So three out of four were, were you know. Imagine if it would have been diff- a pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah. Well, going different ways on. So definitely very interesting there. Um, honestly, down the card, there's a couple of uh, interesting fights. Kai Kamaka making his Bellator debut. Obviously, he was a weird cut, um, at least in my opinion. He was 1-2-1 one, and one, coming off a draw. Um, he lost to TJ Brown, Jonathan Pierce. I thought it was a weird cut, but whatever. Especially considering he got robbed the last time as well, his last time out in the UFC. Um, and also, Spike Carlisle making his Bellator debut, taking on Dan Moret, former UFC veterans, throwing down. That should be a fun fight. Um, obviously, Dan Moret coming off a huge upset win with Gucci Yamaguchi, and then Spike Carlisle... He, that was a weird ass cut. He was one and two, but his two losses had been absolute bangers against Billy Quarantillo and, ba- and Bill Aldeo. That was a weird, weird cut. Hey man, uh, they give these men these three fight contracts, and they're like, "Hey, we want you to do a three and zero." I know it's just so fucking stupid. I, the UC has been really pissing me off lately with a lot of these cuts. They just cut uh, Impa last with uh, last night, so and they also cut Kevin Lee, and they've done a lot of stuff. I mean, I don't think the Impa one's the worst cut they've had though. Like, I mean, he one's... was he was two and two. That one makes a little more sense than uh, another one. Even then, it's still not a great cut. You know what I mean? Yeah, I thought it was pretty fucking terrible, to be honest with you. I mean, he beat, he got two wins in the Contender Series. What's the point of having a guy come into the Contender Series for him to go, if you're going to cut him after going 2-2? Two and, two? and his walking Buckley fight, well, I mean, that was, an, that was an incredible knockout, but he's not going to get that's that's a one percent hitter shot. You know what I mean? Like, that was incredible. And then, and then, our, and then my homeboy, Carlson Harris, comes in and, you know. Puts the nail on the coffin. Yeah, but he but he got a win in between against Sasha Flitnikov, and that was a fun fight. But yeah, it was it was weird. Um, last fight I personally want to go and highlight Kyle Crutchmer, um, phenomenal collegiate wrestler. One uh, he was not one of those guys that both were gave a contract to like whenever they were like as a college wrestler, but he's close enough. Obviously, he's fa- I know he faced Logan Storley in college. Uh, they had a couple of wars there, and 
he came in Bellator. He's had a mixed run. Uh, he's three and one, but he's looking to get back on the on the uh, the right track here. I like the kid a lot. I've seen a lot of interviews with him. Uh, seems like a cool dude. Uh, obviously, he went to Oklahoma State, so fuck him. But uh, he did. <laughs> uh, okay. But yeah, no jokes aside, seems like a cool dude. He's very very young, so that should be a fun fight there. He's taking on uh, Oliver M. Camp on the opening fight of the card. Opening fight of the prelims, rather. So yeah, fun card. It's a fun little card. Um, obviously going down tonight is a recording, so interesting, interesting one there. Uh, is there anything else you want to touch on that one before we move on to our last couple topics of the show? Uh, no, not in particular, man. I think you highlighted it. I mean, I'm just kind of devastated because they lost a couple guys on this card. I mean, they're supposed to have Jordan Lugo on this card, Keon Diggs, JJ Wilson. They ended up not going through. Not sure what happened there, but there were fights that I was excited for. Mm-hmm. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, a couple of fights that got cut. I think this like, that happens like so much more often now. I'm not sure if it's because of COVID, but I feel like we lose fights seemingly. We lose a couple of fights off every single card. You see, Bellator does not matter. Um, shit, dude. Even one's lost fights recently. So yeah, it's it's it, it's weird. Um, but dude, I feel like just moving on. There's not a whole lot to talk about in terms of MMA outside of that. Obviously, one had a card earlier this morning, which is a fucking banger. Really? Um, very, yeah, that. very rarely do I actually turn in, uh, tune into one live, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. We're going to do the standoff awards in a couple of weeks. Do not be surprised if Timothy, uh, Timothy not a shaken's fight against Sargrin Osilov is in there. Holy shit. Um, a, God, I wish I could watch it now. You, I wouldn't put up a highlight video of it, so just go ahead and tune into that. And also, um, Sam Fairtex had a nice fight with Rizzo Uh That was a lot of fun. And Marcos, Marcos Almeida also fought. So it was a very, very fun card. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot to talk about there in terms of like actual, I guess, um, consequences. But yeah, that Timothy Nana Shaken fight. Holy shit. Marcus Bouchesha won his second fight too. Good for him. He did. Yeah. It was, it was a really fun card. Honestly, I didn't know if he was going to win that fight. Not going to lie to you. Yeah, dude, it was a, it was a hell of a card. If, if there's one thing I tell you to go watch, I'd say you to watch that one. And then also the Nana Shaken fight. That was. Whew. Dagestanis are everywhere, my guy. That's all I got to say about that one. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, dude, moving on from MMA to the world of boxing. Now, we did mention this last week. We did not do, like, a full preview because I feel like we're kind of on a similar, you know, similar similar, uh, wavelength with this one. Uh, Tiafimo Lopez obviously taking on George Combosos on DAZN. Obviously, there was so much that went into this one. These dudes hated each other. And, you know, I wrote my preview piece for Sports Kid that week about how this fight kind of turned from just, like, a general – just a general mandatory to kind of taking on a life of its own through all the different promoters that it went through. Um, I would say the hatred that these two built up for one another. Their dad's literally fighting at That's the, um, at the, uh, what was it? The open workouts during the they, week up. They should have had a schedule about. They should have. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's generally pretty standard with, with T.O. Senior, but. Yeah, and literally, the dads literally fought and had to be separated at the open workout. So, yeah, there's so much that went into this one. It turned from just a general mandatory, and George Cambosos, full credit to him. Going in there, he was a really big underdog, and it made sense. I mean, if you look at his, his record, he was 19-0, and but he didn't really have any huge wins of consequence. Uh, you can argue Lee Selby was a good win, but that was a split decision win. It was pretty close. Uh, Mickey Bay, similar case. Both those guys are kind of past their prime now. So, going in, he was a massive underdog. And they're obviously fighting in the garden. Well, they weren't fighting in the garden. They are fighting in the Hulu Theater, which is right by the garden, but whatever. Um, yeah, dude. And what we got was one of the fights of the year. Um, George Cambosos came out firing early, drops T.O., and he seems like he's in control. They're going back and forth. T.O. drops him in the 10th round. Seems like T.O. is going to get his fucking knockout. Tremendous comeback. George Cambosos survives, fires back, and we have some incredible rounds following that. First of all, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you, what did you, who did you actually think won the fight? I know Tio said that he thought he won the fight 10-2, which is completely delusional, uh, uh-huh. but it was it, it was a split decision. Same. So <laughs> who did you have winning this one? You know, I, I obviously was going on at the same time as the, uh, what card was it? Was it that? Triller. The Triller card, and I'm not going to let you, Josh. Yeah. I did tune in to Triller, and it's full entirety. I paid the 20 bucks. Really? I did. What's well, 20 yeah, bucks, Josh? See, I mean, from what I've heard, you're one of the few that actually bought it. So congratulations. Well, dude, it's it's 20 bucks. Like I'm not a, I'm not, I had to be careful there. I was going to use some certain language that would have got me canceled. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I wasn't going to be a uh, 
I wasn't going to be stiff about it, you know, and I spent 20 bucks, man. Like, I played it with someone else. It's 10 bucks each. Like, it was, it ended up being a really fun card, you know. Obviously, we're not getting into it yet, but I spent most of my night watching that. And, uh, you know, sadly, you know, I didn't want to pay for the pay per view, and I was a good person. And I went on Twitter and watched highlights, you oh. know, for catching my drift there. And I wasn't able to give it a lot of focus. But I did, I did see early on when he dropped, uh, when he dropped him and it was looking like a close fight. It looked like it was going back and forth. And look, if it's, I, I'm sure I haven't heard robbery from anybody, so I'm sure he probably deservedly won the fight. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty clear, Combosis decision. I think I scored it for him eight four or seven five. I don't remember exactly which, but yeah, the fact that it was a split decision was pretty damn terrible. But um, yeah, man, it was a tremendous fight. Now, man, Tio, man, I've been, I very rarely am I actually disappointed in the fighter because the thing about fighting is you you earn a inherent respect for the athletes that compete in MMA and in boxing, because you're going in there to literally fight another human being in their underwear. You know what I mean? There's something that goes along with that, that if you have an inherent respect for them and an inherent appreciation, very rarely am I disappointed with the fighter's performance. Holy shit, T.O., man. I, I've never been <laughs> more disappointed. Because it's not that he lost by virtue of, I don't think George Cambosis is a better outright boxer than him. I really don't think he, I think if they run that rematch back, which they're not going to, because he had no rematch clause. Not yet. Um, no, they're not going to run it back. Zero chance. Um, you don't think they'll ever run it back? I feel like they Tio's may kinda, one day, but I think I, think I feel like right they'll now, run it one day. I mean, he has so much time. Tio, Tio's like, what, 22, 23, 24? Uh, 24, I think. Yeah. Yeah, dude. How old is Cambosos? 28. Yeah, dude. Time's on Tio's side. Tio Fimo's side. Yeah, maybe one day they will, but for right now, George Cambosos oh, those, holds, those, holds those all the cards, cards, and he's not going to give him an immediate rematch. Do you think Loma's going to fight uh, uh, Cambosos now? <laughs> I don't know. I think it depends on how Loma's next fight goes. I I, was, I don't know who Kembos is going to fight. Um, because with, that kind of parlays in the conversation for this weekend, because there's a couple of different dudes that are fighting that he could fight next. Devin Haney, obviously, he has a fight against Jojo Diaz. And then also, we have Javante Davis in a fucking mismatch against poor Isaac Cruz. Hey, Isaac um, Cruz is coming on short notice, so you can't really hate on the guy. Like, the guy's stepping up. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I'm not hating on put him. Some, I put think... some respect on Isaac Cruz, Josh. No, no, no. I, hey, look, I did a lot of... Since I, I'll talk about my new job actually at the end of the show, but um, I've done a lot of kind of research into Isaac Cruz. Tough guy. He comes to bang. He's a lot of pressure. But dude, he he he's is real young so and he's outgunned. actually shorter. He's actually he, shorter. He's the first opponent that Javante, at least from like of his last like twelve fights or something, that is actually shorter than him. Yeah, it, it, it had been a while. I, I saw that. I saw that too on ESPN. I think it was supposed to. Yeah, be. in his five four. He looks shorter than 5'4", bro. Let me just tell you that. Like, I'm not sure if you saw him and Gervonta staring each other down. There looked like a couple of inches between them. Gervonta is not big either. He's actually no, he's like five five. On a good day. Yeah. So, and look, dude, I like I like Isaac Cruz. Fun kid. I watched the press conference. He comes to bang. Severely, severely outgunned. Severely, you coming on a short notice. Even if he didn't come on a short notice, he'd be a massive underdog. So, yeah, it's a rough one. But obviously. If you had to go ahead and bet, obviously there's so many fights. Ryan Garcia already called out <laughs> George Cambosos. Ryan uh, needs to get a win first, bro. He's been gone for a while. I know, but he did. I call understand. Him out. I understand mental health, man. But you know what I mean. It's you know. Yeah, but he also hurt his hand too. So it, it's other stuff too. I know. I know that that as well as that. That didn't help but, either. You know, he obviously George has been called by everybody. To wins a rematch, which won't happen. But Devin Haney's fighting this weekend. Javante's fighting this weekend. If you had to go and put money down, obviously Loma's was fighting in a couple of weeks. If you had to go and put money down, who would you see as the most likely to next fight the new unified champion, George Combosos? You know what's going to happen? He's not going to fight any of those guys, which I think will be fucking hilarious. Really? I could see that happening, Josh. I could legitimately see it happening, and he fights like a mandatory. Yeah, I could actually see that happening as well. Like I kid which you. Really sucks. <laughs> I mean, if you if I really had to try. I'd probably say, like, some sound weird, I think. I'd say, like, Haney 1, Loma 2, and then everybody else falls behind. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, I think the most likely is Haney. I think the fact that Devin Haney's fine. Which, by the way, that doesn't interest me at all. Yeah, same here. Which is weird, because it's like, I do want to say, oh, I think the one good thing about that is it's guys that should be fighting, fighting each other, you know? I mean, there's so much talent in these divisions and at these weight classes, it's like, you know, we've seen it, dude. I mean, 
even Mario Barrios, dude, who lost to Gervonta, is still a good guy who I could see. Like, I'd love to see him fight literally any of the names we just mentioned. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think the thing about George Cambosos is interesting. He's the guy that nobody wanted. You know what I mean? I feel like we were all we were talking about all the like the what is it like the four kings at, at lightweight. Like you had you had Haney, Lopez, Gervonta, and then you had fucking um, oh my god, whose name am I forgetting? Ryan, maybe. I mean, you can uh, name but, all the. I mean, you can name yeah. all the young guys. Like, those yeah, guys yeah. Are all, name they're all under what twenty five, probably. Yeah. All in, yeah, like it's actually crazy. They're all under twenty five, and they're. But guys. instead, you have this guy from Australia who most people didn't know until they announced the original fight with To, and now he's the champion. Like it's. I mean, it's, I knew of him, but not in the sense that I knew of like the other guys who were like these young studs coming up. But you know, some of them have you know some history in the AMs and. They've talked shit, and they're all undefeated. Well, formerly all undefeated, you know? Yeah. But, you know, realistically, uh, though, one of these guys is going to be a guy, like, at one point, and I hope, one of these guys fights all four or five of these guys. It has to. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that. I really hope that happens. And we get to see who get. and I'm sure that guy will be an undefeated guy at the mm-hmm. end of their career, which is a crazy thought to think, because all these guys started undefeated. Yeah, entirely. And regardless, though, it is just um, it is a it's just an interesting situation now. Uh, I'm actually going to go and I jokingly, like not even jokingly, I, I legitimately think George Cambosos is not going to fight any of those guys next. Like I'm not sure who he's going to fight. I convinced you, didn't I? It just it makes too much sense for him to actually fight any of those guys. Um, he's going to fight some mandatory, and I think it'd be even funnier if he then lost his mandatory, so that way we can. <laughs> Keep and then that guy's going. champ, and, and we're like, what the fuck? Who is this dude? Exactly. Um, but, dude, I was so impressed with George Cambosos, dude. Like, that 10th that, that round. I was surprised how fast he was. I don't know if you felt the same way, dude. He was real quick. And Tailfim was, was fast, too. I felt like he was even quicker. You know who he reminded me of? And it's funny because they trained together. He reminded me a lot of, not in terms of, like, um, like the punching power. He reminded me a lot of Manny Pacquiao by virtue of the way he kind of glides in and out of the pocket. I'm not sure if you also picked that up because they trained together. Like, he was just getting in, countering, getting the fuck out before T.O. could do anything. It's like, he was quick. His counters were on point, dude. Like, he was... He That's was, a fast white boy. No, yeah, that is that is a fast white boy, dude. Um, yeah, dude, that was just a tremendous performance. And him pulling himself off the canvas after that 10th round was just phenomenal. That was the stuff of legends right there. Because T.O. had him hurt. It was an epic match. I wish I would have seen it in its entirety. You, yeah, I think you should go back and rewatch it because Tio had him hurt. Hey, bad. man, but I was watching Mike Platinum Perry and Derek Campos carry the fucking card of the century, man. Well, you know what? Let, I think we spent enough time on George Campos. So let's go ahead and actually break into that. Was it worth the twenty dollars? <laughs> Fuck yeah, it was, dude. For twenty bucks, that was a fucking steal, honestly. I mean, I, I don't think honestly, I wouldn't have paid. Maybe I would have not paid more for it. I think twenty bucks was a definitely fair price. Like out of all the trailer cards. They priced it perfectly, and they provided very well. Fair enough, fair enough, man. Actually, um, I'll tell you this. I heard Josh Thompson say this on his podcast. He was like, uh, he's like, I honestly think that's the best trailer event they've had. Out of all the events they've had, I think that was the best. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was a little interesting because I was like, you know, Mike and, and Roy wasn't bad. That was that was exciting. But, you know, that was for the culture, you know, which was a little different. But, you know. They could have had anybody promoting that. Oh, yeah. It they could have had really much of a trailer show. They only had, like, one or two musical people. Like, it was, it was just... That promoted itself. They did not have to do anything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, dude. Like I, I'll. I'm actually gonna go ahead and agree. I thought that was the best chiller show, top to bottom. That shit. Also, it's Metallica. You, you know, Metallica doesn't really fucking miss. So that was another thing they did right. That's true. And uh, that was just that was a lot of fun, dude. You know what makes me happy about this whole thing? Um. So here's here's a fun fact for you. Those were all. They were all. What do they call it? Triad combat bouts, right? So those went down as professional, according to the commission, which I've seen, they all went down as professional boxing matches with oh, mixed shit. rules. But they qualified as professional boxing matches. So what that means, Mike Perry defeated a 25-3 and three boxer, uh, now 25-3, and 25-2 boxer, Michael Seals, in a boxing match. Who fought for a title last Who year. Who fought yeah. for a title. So and Mike got dropped. Mike, Mike got, got dropped. dropped. And he got back up. It was sick, dude. It was. It was the stuff of legends. And, uh... The fight of the night was the Derek Campos fight, though. Like, dude, Derek Campos was so fucking good, dude. He was so fucking fun to watch. Like, you got, you gotta admit it, right? Like, can you agree with me oh, on yeah. here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love me some Derek Campos. I don't know why he's gone for Bellator, honestly. 
dude, I was like, dude, I was like, I completely forgot this name. Like, I was so happy to see him, like, on the card. I was like, Terry Compos, let's see. And Josh, you picked against, you thought, like, the MMA guys were going to lose. The MMA guys ended up fucking winning. Well, here's the thing is I didn't know what, I, I was misled with a lot, either misled or I just misread um, a lot of the stuff going in. I thought it was going to be in a cage because they had all the promotional stuff inside of a cage. Really? Right? I, I, but we had talked about the triangular ring, like, near the end, though. Yeah, correct. But I, I thought it was gonna for some reason I thought it was gonna be a triangle like cage. Oh, you like, thought they were lying to us? Like they 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 said a triangle, but it, it wasn't gonna actually happen. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it was gonna be like no no no. I'm saying like I was I knew it was gonna be a triangle. I thought it was gonna be a triangle cage, oh. not a triangle ring because all their stuff they showed was inside of a cage. Okay, okay. <laughs> and also I thought that I know that the that the gloves were open hand. I thought they were gonna be like a kickboxing type glove. I know they were open hand. I know a lot of. Do it. Yeah, had I known a lot of the stuff, I would have picked the MMA guys all day. Well, granted, good thing you didn't pick all the MMA guys because the uh, well, Matt Mitrione got robbed. We'll, we'll talk about that one. But you like, really, I, I forgot about that one. I, I, that's you know, I watched it, but I was kind of, I kind of just did lose a little disinterest because I was like, oh, I don't know about Matt Mitrione. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, it, let me restate this. It was not much of a robbery. It was what I do hate in, um, in, in judging sometimes. Wait, did you watch the part in its entirety? I, I didn't ask you that. I, I watched, uh, yeah, I watched it all in its entirety. Okay, I was just curious about that because I didn't know if you had yeah. watched it fully. Because I watched oh, yeah. it from top to bottom. And by the way, you saw there was a ref change. Like I know Dan, I know uh, it was Dan Marie Lotta, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Dan, he came yeah. in for the main main card, but I think he came in before that because I don't know if you noticed the ref who was on before. He wasn't kind of like letting them clinch a lot. He was breaking you know? them up immediately. I'm like, that's the whole point, dude. <laughs> yeah, and then Dan came in, and you saw, like, the whole fight pace change. Oh, yeah, entirely. Because what um, I said Dan, was, it was like BKFC, but not bare knuckle. That's what yeah, I thought. And, and, and Dan, had his, Dan had his fuck up later up in the night, but, you know. You yeah. know, I, I don't think, okay, you know, I'll be one to defend him on here. It, it, really? You're going to defend uh, that stoppage? To an extent, but not. You know what I mean? We we can get into it. Okay, yeah. Well, let's go and break into it. First of all, um, this is a horrific mismatch. Now, yeah. this, is all, this is always going to be the case. I'm, I even, um, I always thought going in, it's like either Frank can clinch him and tire him out, or he's going to get caught immediately. Turns out he got caught damn near immediately. Now, he got knocked out. What is it? Actually, it might have been within the last few seconds of the round. Um, which I think was part of the reason Dan let it go uh, for as long as he did. But, yeah, um, he gets caught with a right hand, straight right, and he was on – he was gone. Like, he was so gone, um, and Dan let it go. You thought that was okay. Like, you thought it was like you understood. Okay, look, of- it, it's, it, it's weird because, look, he, he – if you remember right, Pulev kind of quit hitting him because he was like, oh, fuck. And, uh, you know, it, it's weird because it's like – you know, it's it, it's almost as if Pulev was giving him time to recover, you know. Mm. But it's but it's like, you know, it's it you know he it was also him trying to like he wasn't giving it, it was a weird spot, you know. I don't think it's it, I I can see what he was trying to do. It just looked really bad, you know. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. And I actually I'm gonna actually go ahead and correct you there. People say Pulev held back, bro. He hit him with that right. He hit him with that right cross, and he immediately went for an uppercut to kill him. And then he missed that by the grace of God. I'm convinced divine intervention. You you stops. saw though there was a moment though there was a pause at one point though like there, there was, was like, there was a pause but then he he went for a fucking bus driver uppercut that missed. Thank God had that had that connected. You know I think under yeah. I think under better circumstances I think if you had a different heavyweight in there who I think it would have been maybe a little different. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I, I think that was just just I think because of the rule set. You know what I mean? And plus that Frank's not a stand up guy. Yeah, although I thought he actually looked pretty good against Steve Cunningham. You know, he did he did a good job. Made Bad a good boxing, job. you know, and Steve Cunningham has a level, and you know, Pulev yeah. literally. Just, no joke, Pulev's last fight before this was Anthony Joshua. I know, which <laughs> is insane. That's yeah, I can't. That 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 was that was my whole basis on why I knew Frank Mir was going to get destroyed. Yeah, for sure. Hey, um, but he, he was, said he had a nice payday though, so good for him. He did. He had a nice payday, so good for Frank getting paid. Yeah, I'm not sure how sure they can keep on putting on these shows. I thought it was a fun show, though, man. I thought it was a fun show. Is there anything else you have, like, closing thoughts on the trailer card before we wrap up? I mean, I thought it was fun. I mean, that one chick at the start, dude, she had fucking hands. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you remember her. She was on the other card. She fought, like, an older woman. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, she, Alexa she was Culp, M- I think, out of KC. She was an MMA girl, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, she was a fucking savage, dude. Uh, yeah, she was a badass. I think she was the badass of the night. No cap. Entirely. Uh, she wasted no time, dude. Oh, yeah. Outside of Derek Campos, you know, who was also a fucking badass. And, you know, my boy Mike Platinum Perry, who, you know, is a future champ. Uh, and whatever the fuck he plans on doing now. <laughs> you know, honestly, after watching that, that just gave me hope for BKFC for him. Not gonna lie. Oh, yeah, same. Same. I, I, I thought that, uh, he looked really, really good, dude. And honestly, he, the thing about his UC tenure, which is, it's funny to think about, um, he was always the swing and bang guy, but he really stopped being a good striker near the end there. Like, I remember him getting jabbed to death by Tim Means. I remember that, uh, Mickey Gall was tuning him up until the second round, until he gassed out. Like, it was, it was weird now the end there, but it looks like he's gotten his thing. He's, looks like he's back in a group. And he outgrappled like, Mickey Gall. And showed his best skill set, which is actually... I know, that was such a weird dude. fight, dude. <laughs> that, was good. That, that, that was such a weird fight. Mickey got out grappled, but he also outstruck Perry. It was such a weird situation. <laughs> you know, it, it's been an interesting... Uh, it was an interesting, like, event, dude. I uh, Just to talk a little bit more about it before... I know we're going to close out here in a minute or two. Yeah. But uh, how'd you feel about the, the triangular ring? Triangle, tri- triangular, the Dorito. I don't know what you want to call it, dude. The Dorito ring. I thought the Dorito ring was all right. It was a little um, weird though when they're like, "Go to your corners." And it's like, the, you know, yeah. they're right there. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I thought that was a little bit weird, but overall, I thought it. I thought it did kind of, you know, promote action, which is what their intent was. Yeah, it promoted action, and if you had the right ref in there, it worked very well. Actually, and it was very entertaining. Exactly. Yeah, it did work out whenever they did have the right. uh the right ref, um, which is still, I mean, I can't believe, I remember that first fight, which was a banger, but like, the ref kept on breaking up immediately, and I'm like, dude, what, did you not catch, did you not, they did not tell you beforehand what the whole fucking point of this is? Uh, I'm a little is? sad, there wasn't more like spinning strikes, I think, who was it, did Frank Muir throw one? Or was it Mike Perry? Um, I think I it was Perry. Probably. I can't remember, but I wish there would have been more spinning strikes, I know obviously like, you know, they can't throw elbows and shit, and throwing, like, a spinning back fist isn't, like, the most ideal thing in general, you know? But it can work. But yeah, I wish I, was, I would have I wish I would have seen someone who just would have been like, you know something, I'm gonna be a fucking Blade Blade, you know? <laughs> just some <laughs> yeah, crazy they should have gotten more guys who were kind of, um, good at spinning shit, you know what I mean? From MMA? I mean, I don't know who would have done it, I don't know who they could have got, you know, who's not actively on a roster, you know, or in BKFC or something, or even... I don't know. I don't know if Bellator would have allowed one of the other guys to do this. I know they're they're one of the you know so one of the few promotions that you know they'll let guys do shit like this, like go do boxing or go to another promotion, do things out. Things. Yeah, like true. That. Yeah, still though, it was it was a very fun card. I'll give him full credit. I thought it was a lot better than. I mean, it was a lot better than what I expected. Um, that that main event, I think, got. A lot more criticism, like the most th- talked about thing, obviously, was the main event and the stoppage. Had that not happened, I think we'd be having like a lot better of a conversation because I thought it was fun, but like I'm talking more about like, the MMA space in general, would have a lot po- more positive view because that was the only real fight that was a mismatch. Um, even Mitrione against Flores, which I thought was a mass, a mismatch going in. I mean, Matt beat his ass for the first few rounds there, so, um, Obviously, he lost the decision, but it was one of those decisions, like, I know you mentioned you weren't really watching it, but, like, he knocked him down in round two, and he was going for the early finish. He nearly got it. He couldn't, though. And it was one of those fights where, like, Matt dominated the first, like, four rounds, but then, like, the last, not last, uh, first four. It was more like the first three rounds, right? He dominated and put him down, but the last four rounds were close. So Flores took all the close rounds, and uh, Matt ended up losing via, like, split, I think. Dude, he got nice. roasted. I remember he got roasted. They're like, you didn't like wrestling. Now you got to stand up fight and you lose it. Yeah, which I do hate stuff like that. Just it's it's judging, um, but that's that's the sport, I guess. Um, yeah, dude, that's pretty much that's pretty much all my thoughts on it. Thought it was fun, but it is what it is. That's how it goes, man. I mean, it, it was exciting. It was fun. It was worth the twenty bucks. I definitely spent another twenty bucks if they have the right people on there again and you know a good main event. I feel like they. This has potential if they do it right and get the right people in it. Mm-hmm. Entirely. It has the potential that you need to get it down and fine-tune the matchmaking, which is always the biggest issue with Triller. This is like the, the lopsided matchmaking has always been one of my biggest issues. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, if they can figure that out, then who knows? They may have a recipe here. Like, uh, honestly, Frank fun. Mir versus Matt Mitrione, I think, would have been a fun matchup. Or even, I don't know, any 
any almost any other heavyweight boxer because they managed to make a fun one between Matt Mitrione, who's past his prime, and Flores. And Flores is like a top. I don't know. I don't know where Flores is ranked, but he fought Luis Ortiz before this. Um, so he's not a bad guy by any means. Mm-hmm. But they had a competitive fight with that one. It's just if you're going to do an MMA guy against a boxing guy, top level boxing guy, you got to have a top level MMA guy in there so it makes sense. Frank is old as shit, and he's a BJJ guy, so it makes no sense. Um, but yeah, dude, that's generally all my thoughts on it. It was an okay card, but I'm not sure how much longer they can keep on doing this. Like, I really they're, don't they're, know. They're still going, and they have a card. They have a card. I don't know if it's already happening or it's coming up. It, but already, it already happened, yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't even... Who the fuck knows how that went? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I no idea, no idea. Uh, but yeah, dude, that's generally all I have on this, um, at least to close out the show. Uh, that was a good. That was a good week. There wasn't a whole lot to talk about, but I think we we sh- we did as about as good as we could with the topics that we had. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. Something I did go ahead and mention. I wanted to talk about briefly before I end the show. Um, if you guys are not aware, I do have a new job. I mentioned it briefly on a podcast that I actually did um, with my my buddy Far- Farzan Vesuvian, who is a former Chiefs reporter, worked at Bleacher Report. Great guy, known him for a long time on his a podcast. Banger. Great. Uh, did you listen to it? I did. I listened to it entirely. Oh, yeah, dude. It was really, really fun. Um, he asked me to go ahead and join on, and I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and I obviously did recently join up with the kind of my announcement. I did recently join up with SportsKeeda.com to work on the boxing MMA section. So sometimes if I mention stuff, you know, about – normally I'll mention about Kate Chat Press. It'll no longer be that. It'll be SportsKeeda. SportsKeeda.com. Be sure to follow them um, to check out all of my stuff relating to writing, and I'm that's – I mean, I'll probably be talking a bit more about boxing because that's kind of what I was put on there for. I've always been a boxing fan, but I really had the opportunity to, to write about it. So if it's an awesome opportunity. Be sure to go ahead and go ahead and follow them. Be sure to follow us on at Josh Siminoff. He's at Andrew Take underscore 01 at Courtside Sound 1 for all things relating to the show. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Peace and bye, please. Mouse click.